Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing this evening? It is 1 a.m. and I'm just driving, listening to music. I'm really into this band that my friend introduced me to like three years ago. And one of their songs came up. I bought a bunch of their music like three years ago because he and I would sit and listen to it. And um, we would go to meetings and then after meetings we would listen to it. And it just kind of popped up on my iTunes. And it's The National, the band The National. And I really forgot about them. And so I've been listening to them and there's this, sl this song, this song. <laughs> Oh my lord, no, not that. <laughs> There's this song <laughs> called Slow Show by The National, and um, <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. Well, I didn't say it exactly like you say it, but you know. <laughs> Anyway, there's this song by The National called Slow Song, Slow Show. <laughs> and I really, really like it. It's like one of my favorite songs of theirs. So I've been kind of listening to it on repeat. I do that. I kill a song. Do you guys do that? I like listen to a song over and over and over again until I don't want to listen to it anymore. So anyway, oh, what a good day it was today. Got up. <clears throat> went and got my, I meant to put my coffee cup back in here because was, it was empty at home and I forgot, but um, got up and went and got my coffee at Starbucks and then I did some errands and then I did a review of Joella's vegan chicken. It was so good, you guys. It was, oh my God, it was so delicious. And I ate like half of it and I saved the other half. Um, for later, I tried to get Alex to, eat, to try it and eat some of it, but he wouldn't eat any of it. He's like, I don't want to try vegan chicken. He doesn't like, my husband is like, he knows what he likes and he doesn't try a whole lot outside of that. <laughs> he just doesn't like to try new things. So, um, but I did that review and that was fun. And then um, I had like another errand I had to run and then I came home and um, it just got really hot in this car. I don't know why. Let me turn on my air. Hold on. And then, oh, because the air's off, that's why. And then I uh, made a drama video and a Peterisms video. Alex had gotten home like right before I made my Peterisms video. Um, and then I ate the rest of my chicken stuff. And he had had like a late lunch. He had like a lunch meeting. And he had like a late lunch. He had nachos, so he said he was full. And um, we were gonna watch Ma tonight, but he was like, I'm so tired. I don't know why I'm so tired. And I was like, well, what do you wanna do? He's like, I just wanna lay in bed and rest. So he literally laid in bed and I talked on the phone. Oh, I talked on the phone for a little bit. Um, I talked to my friend Valerie. And then I was like sitting outside and I was like watching uh, these videos back because he was inside and I thought he was like sleeping and watching TV. So I was sitting on the front porch and this neighbor of mine who, uh, like a neighbor that I get along with actually, she lives like down the street. She walked up and so she came up with her dog and she sat down on the patio and we talked for like an hour. Her son came up, he was like riding his bike around the neighborhood. So he came up and um, she and I talked forever and it was fun. I know I like don't seem like that neighborly person, but I like really am that person. We just don't have the nicest neighbors because they're they're older, and so their focus is on things like um, you need your carriage light is out, you need to replace it, and this. And she and I were talking a little bit about that. Um, so she was like, "Yeah, I just don't know what to do about this and whatever." I'm like, "Just let some things go, I guess." But anyway, it was fun, and um, I've been craving lemonade all day. I don't know why. I had a cream soda with my Joella's hot chicken. If you guys live in Louisville, Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, or in Indianapolis, you need to try Joella's hot chicken, I'm telling you. It's probably one of my favorite reviews I've ever done. Like, I truly, truly can stand, uh, so the lane is closed ahead. I truly, truly can stand behind. Oh, I know what I did today. I listened to a lot of my audiobook. I have like 40 minutes left of it, and I am finishing it tonight. I've got to finish that audiobook tonight. It actually started getting really, really good, which is crazy that in like the last two hours, it gets really good, but, um, but if you live in Louisville or Le Louisville, Kentucky, Lexington, Lexi, 
if you live in Louisville, Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, or Indianapolis, I think those are the three places that have it. And then somebody else said that they're coming to Atlanta. So I don't know about that, but you should definitely try out Joella's Chicken. And it's not just uh, vegetarian vegan options they they have a vegan chicken patty on there which is really good if you are a vegetarian or vegan but they also like it's mostly just that's just one option the rest is all chicken and they have chicken sandwiches and chicken patties and chicken tenders and then you can like pick how hot you want the sauce to be on it that you, like they cook it in it's like barbecue and then they have all these different sauces I think they have like 10 or 12 or 8 so I think it's like 10 sauces that they have that you can dip like dipping sauces and they are so good The macaroni and cheese is unbelievable. The fries are fantastic. It's just it's really good. So I would highly highly recommend it um, Yeah And that was my evening and then um, I Was I'm wanting to get off of this ramp here and like there's all this construction I'm like is there no ramp to get off at this exit anymore? Can you not I guess you can't get off here, so I guess I have to go to the next exit. Okay, can't get off here. <laughs> oh, here's the exit right here. Um, so then I had all my videos and stuff done, and Alex was laying in bed. I was like, what are you doing? He was like, I'm just trying to catch up on my TV shows. He came outside when I was sitting out there to bring the dogs out, and he looked like he had been sleeping for about two hours straight, which I think he was. And... Um, so he um, was just catching up on his TV shows, but he was like all huddled underneath the, the covers of the bed and stuff like that. So I came upstairs and I laid down for like an hour and um, let's take a drive out in the country, the spooky, spooky country. Um, I wrote a song for Tucker today. <laughs> the song goes like this. Tukey. It's based on Jeepers Creepers. But we call Tucker Tukey. And so I was like, Tukey, Tukey. How'd you get so spooky? <laughs> he kept on running around while I was singing it to him. <laughs> and then Boo Radley was jealous because he didn't have a, um, a song. But I already have a song for Boo Radley and it goes like this. <laughs> How does it? Boo Radley. Is it a song or just a saying? I always say, hey, Boo Radley, why you, um, Boo Radley, why you always so sadly, Boo Radley, so sadly, because he always looks so sad. But anyway. <laughs> so I laid down for like an hour, and then I got up, and then I was staying, there, or I was laying there talking to Alex for a little bit. He had just finished his show, and then he was going to bed. And then I came downstairs and I got on Audible, which was a total rabbit hole that I fell down because I was looking at all these books that were out and all these new books because I'm almost done with my book. So then what do I do instead of reading a book that I already have when I was going to listen to my true crime book for this month is I start getting excited because I'm like, I'm going to get in this book. And I almost bought this, I don't know if it's a new Stephen, Kil uh, St Stephen King book. I can't remember what it's called. The Institute, I think. I think it's new. And, um, but maybe not. I don't know. But it's like eight, 18 hours or something. And um, I was like, I don't want to make a commitment to 18 hours because that could take me three months at the rate that I'm going right now. So I was like, I'm not going to do that. And I know I say this every night, but this is not going to be um, a long vlog tonight because last night I said it wasn't going to be a long vlog and it ended up being... Um, like almost an hour. It was like, what, 57 minutes or something like that. I looked. <laughs> I think I know exactly that it was 57 minutes because I looked at the end of it and it was like 57 something. And I was like, oh, I didn't know it was that long. So tonight I'm going to aim it at being a little uh, shorter. Tookie, tookie, how'd you get so spooky? <laughs> I'm ready for Halloween season, let me just tell you. Oh, darn it. I was looking at, um, <laughs> damn it, Janet. I was looking at that scary movie that is on Netflix. It's about, okay, it's about this guy named Earth the Clown, and he goes to this dilapidated apartment. I've read the, like, the trailer for it, like, or not the trailer, but I've read the synopsis for it, like, four times, and I was reading it to Alex tonight. I think it's called, it's not the Terminator, but it's something like that. I keep on wanting, wanting to say the leveler, but it's not called the leveler. Um... When I get to this gas station up here, I'll pull in and see what it's called if I if I remember by then. It's <laughs> I'm like ten minutes from this gas station, um, but it's about this 
on Halloween Eve. It came out this year on Netflix. On Halloween Eve, in this a, a dilapidated apartment building, Art the Clown slices and dices these people up or something. Slices and spatters. I'll read it to you. But I think that what makes me want to watch it is that the movie poster for it looks so good. And I did see the movie poster at um, Horror Hound Weekend because I was like, how do I know... Um, how do I know that um, movie poster? Such a calm evening outside. Tomorrow night I have my home group meeting. We don't have a business meeting tomorrow night, thank God, which means I don't have to get there early. And then Wednesday, I have um, a commitment in the evening, and then a sobriety commitment in the evening, and then um, Thursday, I have some things I have to do during the day. Um, there's like literally nobody on this road. I've had my um, rights on since I passed that last car, and there's like not one car out here. <clears throat> myself real scared. What else happened today? Anything exciting? Anything else exciting? <clears throat> no, but I had, like, when I was reading this book, or this book that I'm listening to, um, Lock Every Door, I, it kept on reminding me of something. It reminded me of another book. And there was actually a TV show on that it kind of reminded me. It's about this, um, that was weird. That was like, that actually looked like the Jeepers Creepers truck. And it was like pulled onto the side street in front of this house out in the middle of nowhere in the country. See, I can get myself real scared. But um, there was this TV show years ago. I feel like Alex and I started watching it. And it was about this guy that lived in this like old building in, in New York City. It was called like the name of the building. It was like the number of the building or something. I don't remember, but it was like a scary show. I think it was like a building that used to be a hotel and they turned it into an apartment building or something like that. I think it only made it like one season. But then it also reminded me of something else and I, I for the life of me could not figure out what it reminded me of. Well, it starts getting, I don't want to ruin it for anybody unless they want to read it, but it starts getting very uh, Rosemary's Baby. And I immediately was like, as soon as it kind of went down that, you know, I won't say rabbit hole again. That's not even appropriate to say. <laughs> when it started going down that road, so to speak, is when I was like, oh, this totally reminds me of Rosemary's Baby. Like, a lot. And it was weird. I was like, I don't know. I mean, kind of the whole, a different idea. Um, turn off my brights. There's a car coming. But, still, like, similar idea, but different. I don't know. There aren't really any original ideas out there, are there? I mean, Rosemary's Baby was about her having the baby and what the baby represented. You know, there was, I think there's a Rosemary's Baby too, and I never saw it. But I don't think that it was, um, I think Ira Levin wrote the original book. I feel like I tried to read it. My mom used to tell me, um, so I was born the summer of 72, and um, either Rosemary's Baby came out that year or The Exorcist, and I don't know if it was the book or the movie that came out that year, but it was also like one of the hottest summers ever in Chicago, and the Pope came to visit, and Watergate was going on, and my mom said that, like, that whole summer, she was just kind of, like, you know, stuck in this apartment building in, um, with, no, like, no centralized air conditioning in Evanston, Illinois, and so, like, all she would do is just, like, walk to the beach with me, and then come back, and then, like, nap and whatever, because it was so hot, and she would, like, watch the Watergate hearings and things like that, and, um, and she's like, you know, I always think back on that being like your first year and how weird it is that, um, 
I, I always think this because my mom said that she was so thankful. She remembers she was so thankful that I was born in June because I was actually like supposed to be, uh, I was two weeks late. And so she said that she was so thankful because she knew, like had a friend that would like delivered in like September or late August and that like her pregnancy took her through July and August and it was like so hot to be pregnant. My mom was so thankful that she had given birth like earlier in that summer. But, um, she said, she, you know, she always thought it was weird, like, that first year of my life was consumed with, like, whatever the... I think it was The Exorcist. I, because, like, she used to say that their apartment building that they lived in reminded her of Rosemary's Baby. And it had, like, a closet that, like, their apartments were, like... It used to be one big apartment, but it was separated into two. They lived in this three-story building in Evanston. And it was, like, uh, like... So, it used to be... On each floor, it was two apartments, and but it used to be just one apartment on each floor, and then they separated it into two apartments. And she said, like, there, if you remember Rosemary's Baby, there's a part at the end where she, like, goes through the closet, because she's, like, um, she can see that, like, it's not a real backing to the closet, and that's how, how she can hear them in there and stuff like that. And uh, my mom was like, that was, our closet was like that, and she's like, we had a neighbor that reminded me of, do you remember Ruth Gordon that played in that movie? She was also in that movie, Harold and Maude. Oh, my God. My mom loved that movie. I love that movie, too. Harold and Maude. It was very weird, but I loved it. Had the greatest soundtrack ever. It had that Cat Stevens soundtrack. It was like every song was by Cat Stevens. If you want to be free, be free. If you want to be me, be me. I loved that um, soundtrack. Well, I don't think it had a soundtrack, but I had all those songs. I have all those songs downloaded on my iTunes. My mom loved Cat Stevens. So anyway, she said that whole summer. So I think it was The Exorcist that came out that year. I don't know the book or the movie, but either she was reading the book or she saw the movie or something because I remember her talking about like all that stuff. And she said something about the Pope coming too. It's like a huge deal, the Pope coming to Chicago. I feel like she said something like he didn't end up coming for some reason or something, but he was supposed to come or he did come and it was like a huge deal in Chicago that year. And um, I can't remember. But anyway, she used to always tell me all that stuff about like the, like my, you know, when I was really, really little. She would say that, like, that was during when my dad was doing his medical residency. And he did his medical residency through Northwestern. And so, but he did it at Cook County Hospital. And, um, so my dad would have, she, she, she would always say, like, my parents, like, never really, like, even long after they were divorced, I mean, they were never friends. Um, there was no, like, I think they loved each other as people, and they loved each other as my parents, but there was no love lost there, if that makes sense. They, they just didn't, like, there was a lot of, I think, hurt and pain that had, you know, occurred there over really nothing. I mean, not really anything happened. Um, nothing really happened. I remember asking my dad later, and he was just like, you know, he was like, I realized that we weren't in love anymore and your mom didn't want to accept it. And he was like, you know, I tried to have a civil separation with her and she didn't really want to hear it. And he was like, you know, I thought that we deserved to get out of this and at least one of us would get out and have, you know, something. And I was hoping that, you know, she would. And But she didn't start dating, you know, for a while. My mom, like... <clears throat> I think she was scared of it. And I think she also, like, you know, the time that my mom was a single mom, there were not tons of single moms. <coughs> there were, but there just weren't in where we lived. Because I can remember my mom talking a lot. I mean, I look back on this now, and I think it's so bizarre, you know? So, you know, I was born in 72. So my parents got separated when I was five or six. Six, I think. So that would have been 78. I always get those ages wrong. I never know. My dad always tells me it's different. But so, 78, you know, and I remember my mom always talking about how, like, she felt like she was judged coming from a split family. Or that she was part of a, a di divorced woman and, you know, part of a split family. She felt like the men in the street looked down on her and things like that. And um, she didn't get invited. Like, my mom, like, this is true. Like, my mom wouldn't get invited. She had, like, two women on the street that she was really, really good friends with. But other than that, like, my mom didn't get invited to uh, 
like women's luncheons that they would do on the street and things like that. Um, anything that was going on, like a block party, like we were not invited. It was really weird. Like I look back on that now and I remember my mom saying stuff to me when I was older and she's like, you don't remember it, but I do. Like we would sit inside and like the block party would be going on and nobody would invite us. Like there was one block party that we were invited to and I didn't, I think I didn't go to it. I think I was, I don't know. I think she went with like a friend or something, but we just like weren't like, sh you know, and anything that was any issue with the house or anything, my mom would call my dad, like, um, and she would, like, say, you need to deal with this because, they, like, these men on the street don't respect me. And he would deal with it. You know, my dad was good with her in that way. And, um, so they respected each other. But I remember my dad, like, I asked him when I was older, you know, like, well, what happened? Because she wouldn't really ever say... She would just say, you know, like, well, we fell out of love. And my dad said that too. And he was like, we just fell out of love. And, and I know your mom would have stayed in the marriage forever. And he was like, you know, I just, I thought we both deserved to have something else if we weren't going to be happy and we weren't going to work on the marriage. And he was like, it was too far gone by that point. So, Yeah. I think it was tougher on her than I had any idea, you know? And I do think that that had a lot to do with the drinking. I mean, I think that she was genetically an alcoholic, but I also think that it had a lot to do with the drinking. I think she was lonely. I think she was scared to death. I mean, she'd say to me all the time, like, you know, I, I grew up in a nice sized house, you know, and it backed up into the woods. And I mean real woods. I'm not talking about 10 feet of 20 feet of woods. I'm talking about like we had real, like the house was in the woods and, um, you know, we had a creek that ran behind our house. It was beautiful. But, um, you know, she would get very scared. She was always really scared there. And she would say, you know, like, this is just a lot of house for me. And she was so resistant about moving out of there and moving into the condo. But then when she did, I remember she was so happy to be in the condo. And she was like, it's just like, it's perfect for my size. And I don't need a whole lot more. And, you know, she got rid of so much stuff. Um... And I think it was, you know, nice for her to just have, like, smaller, you know, she didn't have to worry about getting the, the lawn mowed. She didn't have to worry about, you know, taking care of all that kind of stuff. She just could live, you know, and I think it was really nice for her. I always say that to friends of mine that go through divorce and they don't have kids or their kids are grown. I'm like, do you ever think about getting, like, a smaller place? And they're like, no, I don't want to leave the house that, like, you know, we had and the kids had growing up and whatever. I'm like, I know, but, like, my mom got, like, got her own little place and, you know, she had little plants around that she loved and she'd stay... And she felt very safe. My mom felt extremely safe in the condo, you know? And I think it, like, it... It also coincided with her getting sober six months later. But I think, because she moved out, and then six months later, she got... She moved out of our house into the condo when I was in drug, when I was in drug and alcohol treatment the last time that I got sober. So, um, I'm like... I was like, please don't let the camera have stopped like 10 minutes ago. I have no idea where I'm at. I'm almost there. Anyway, um, and then she got sober six months later. And I think that it, that all kind of happened at this, like the same time. Like I think it had to, had to for her. I think she was, um, I think she was real scared in that house, you know, and it was a lot for her to take care of and, um, you know, we had, like, in that house that I grew up in, we had a full basement that was literally one, two, one, two, three rooms off to the side. Like, you would go down the stairs, and then to the immediate left was a laundry room. Hold on, it's going to stop. Okay, so you go down the stairs, and it was those stairs that, you know, like, wood stairs that have, like, like, you could look through them. Do you know what I mean? So somebody could grab your legs. And you and the whole basement was unfinished. So it was all cement. And, and cement blocks and stuff. And you would go downstairs. And then to the immediate left was the laundry room. All cement. With, like, washer and dryer. You know. Line for hanging clothes and whatever. And then if you went around to the right, it was this huge room. That's where me and my friends would, like, roller skate in the winter. And, um, with you know, and then to the right of that, around the corner of the stairs, was another room that was pitch black and, like, had crawl space rooms open, like, you know, where you could get up and go into a crawl space, and then on the other side of the big room was another small room that had crawl spaces, and it was on the ground floor, okay, it was underneath, like, on, 
the main floor of the house, when you walked in on from one side was the main floor, but this was like, so the, the house was like this. I don't even know how to explain it. But so it was level with the back of the house. And so there were two bolted doors that went out to the backyard into the woods from right there. And there were windows down there too. Was there one window or two? I think there was two windows. And so my mom would be there alone on weekends and she would think she would hear somebody that had come through down there, that had come inside the house. And we had a bolted wooden door that went from the stairs to the kitchen. But any, I mean, you could have kicked that door down. It wasn't that heavy. And I mean, I remember she would like, she would say to me, like as I got older in high school, like, you know, she would call me and she'd say, I think somebody's in our basement. And, and this would be even be when she wasn't like drinking and intoxicated. And I'd be like, what do you mean, mom? And she'd say, I think somebody's in our basement. Like, I think I can hear somebody in our basement right now. And um, it was a scary house, you know? It really was a scary house to grow up in. And it was, this car is so dying to get by me and pass me by. Um, and it was a big house. I mean, it wasn't a huge, ginormous house, but it was a nice size house, you know? And if she was upstairs in the bedroom all alone, and then all of a sudden she hears something down in the basement, you know? I don't know, I think it was just, it was scary to her, you know? But she also didn't want to leave because it was all she knew, and so I think she felt very stuck. My aunt basically had to like kind of force her out of the house. My aunt was like, you, you have to leave. You cannot stay here any longer. This isn't healthy for you. And I remember she had her go look at two condos. And that was probably a month or two before I went into treatment because I, I remember one day my aunt said, she's not gonna do this unless you come and tell her to do it. Um, that was one thing that changed in our relationship. But at that point, like my mom really like, the only people she would really listen to were, were me and my Uncle Dave, my aunt's husband. And so my aunt called me and she was like, you have to meet us because I'm gonna go show her these two condos and I want you to come with us. And then you, whatever one, you know, you need to push her into one of these condos. She needs to get out of that house, Peter. She needs out of there. It's not healthy for her, it's not safe. And I agreed with her, you know? Um, but I was so in my own addiction and madness that I didn't really think a whole lot about it. And I remember we went and looked at these two condos that day and the other one, it was nice, but it was like in a really, uh, it was like in a young neighborhood and the neighbor, and then the condo that she ended up buying was huge mature trees and it was a nice little pool and had tennis courts and, you know, and I was like, this is perfect, mom. I was like, this is absolutely perfect, you know? I was, and she got real excited about it. And then like the week before, she didn't want to move. She had like, she did not want to move while I was in treatment. So she literally moved out that year drinking like she, I mean, she told me later, she was like, I was at the house drunk on Christmas Eve, packing dishes in the kitchen. And she was like, I just, I, could, I literally almost couldn't emotionally move from where I was. And she was like, and then um, she was like, uh, on Christmas day, she was like, I moved all of my stuff over there when I got up. She was like, I was, you know, hung over and I started moving my stuff over there in the back of my car. And then they got like, you know, movers to move the big stuff. But um, yeah, she really had a hard time with it. She felt stuck, you know, but she had felt stuck in that house for so long too. Okay, I wanna see what this movie is called. So this movie that I wanna see on Netflix that I keep on telling everybody about, which I can't find, <laughs> is called The Terrifier. On Halloween night inside a dilapidated apartment building, Art the Clown stalks his victim, slicing and slaughtering in terrifying silence. I got that almost exact, didn't I? I would pull it up for you and show you that, but the poster won't pull up. I don't know why. I'm almost done with Orange is the New Black, too. I only have like three more um, episodes. Here the Exorcist movie come out. The Exorcist is a 1973 American supernatural horror film, so it came out the year after. Okay, when were the Watergate hearings? Maybe she talk, was talking about the year after I was born. What 
Watergate hearings. What year were the Watergate hearings? June 17th, 1972. That's crazy. That's when they began. Okay, so Exorcist book. When did it come out? It's 1971, so I bet that is when she was reading it. Let's look and see when Rosemary's Baby came out. 1968. So I bet she was reading The Exorcist that summer, watching um, Watergate, and that building reminded her of Rosemary's Baby. Are you starting to see a pattern here with my mother? Yeah, she was a little nuts. <laughs> you wonder where I get it now? <laughs> my obsession with crazy stuff. One more. Oh, I'm kind of hungry. Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Tookie, tookie, how'd you get so spooky? My mom wasn't any less fearful of a person when she was sober, but I do think that it it took away a lot of the um, the, the irrational fear, I think, a lot of for, for her. And I also think living in a neighborhood, you know, where you can walk out on your front porch and there's a neighbor to the right, a neighbor to the left, and a neighbor across the street, where with her, it was like three houses on a cul-de-sac, one, two, three, four houses, well, three and one of the houses was kind of on the cul-de-sac, but three houses on a cul-de-sac and all three of them backed up to the woods. Or two of them backed up to the woods and one was to another street. You know, and so I think she felt isolated out there by her, you know, I think she just felt completely isolated. Like, I don't know. I just think she was scared a lot, you know? Our house didn't have great lighting on it. Like, I mean, I, I think back about that. You know, it's weird, you know, like, with, like, the lights on the houses in our neighborhood, there's, like, I mean, we have so many lights. All my neighbors have motion sensor lights, so as soon as you pull into the driveway, all the lights fly up and stuff like that. You know, it's crazy. And I think back about the house I grew up in, and she had floodlights in the backyard, but she wouldn't put those on a lot at night. And then she had, um, what do you call it? Uh, floodlights off the garage, but then she would have had to have walked into the garage, gone to the, so like, you know, walked down from the mudroom, gone into the garage, walked to the back door, going outside, and turned on the floodlights, and I think she would have been too scared to do that. We had a window in our garage, too, that you could look right in. I don't know, she just always was, like, very scared, and we had a lot of windows in the house, and, um, she could kind of, like, walk from her bedroom downstairs into the kitchen and nobody could have really seen her, you know? Like, through the front door was right there and stuff like that. But I think she just always was very scared, you know? And, um, and I don't know, maybe rightfully so. And, and then I've talked about this on here before, but there was the whole thing with the, the cat burglar that happened that it was, like, a huge issue in Carmel, Indiana. And my mom was part of that case because she, like, he dropped a bunch of jewelry in a jewelry box, like, by the back door. And then that, I think, scared her even more and um, I just think there was a lot there you know and then like and I think back on that house it's like we had these two carriage lights on our side of our door and that was it in the front like that was it that's all that lit up this huge front yard right and we had these Korean apple trees that like hid half the house and then you know Korean boxwood so you couldn't really like trees in front of the windows so like it was a dark house and it sat back we didn't have any lights that were lighting the house or anything like that and then the garage had two carriage lights on it and she hardly ever turned those on so really the only lights in the house were the two right in front of the front door that was it you know and I think she knew how dark it was. She would say that all the time. It's, like, dark and scary, you know? I don't know. And I think that when she got into the condo, she felt safe and she felt cozy. And, um... Like, it's one of the things I don't really mind, you know? It's, like, my neighbors. Like, they were on their patio last night late. And, um... I know that there's something kind of homey about it. I like it. You know, they were out there and, um... 
I mean, you can hear them talking. You just can't hear what they're talking about. It's all like, you know, Charlie Brown, you know, teacher, parent, mumble, blah, 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 you know what I mean? But it, you can hear that there are people around you, and I think it's it's nice. It's homey, you know? I often think I would love to live out here, you know, in the country and whatever, and have barn and have, like, have, have barn, have a barn and, um, you know, have animals and stuff like that. But I just don't really think I would love to live out here. We have a couple friends that live way out there, and I just don't know how that, when I go out there, I'm just like, it's pretty, it's gorgeous, but I just don't know how they do it, you know? It's a lot to take care of, too. Like, Tanya with the kennel, like, I mean, she has to mow it, like, once a week to keep it looking nice. And she has, like, a riding lawnmower, and she loves doing the riding lawnmower. But it's a lot of work. I mean, it takes her, like, two or three hours to do the yard, you know? And um, she'll just put her headphones on. She was making a playlist when I was over there the other night. She's like, what's some of your favorite songs? I was like, for what? She's just like, I'm making a playlist. And I go, favorite songs, like, what's the theme of the playlist? She goes, no theme. I'm just putting songs into my playlist. She's like on Spotify or whatever it is. She loves all that. I don't know. Apple Music or Spotify. She's on one of those. She's always making playlists. She was like, what's a, uh, what did she ask me? Was it Gin Blossoms? It was somebody, it was some old band. I was like, Tanya, I don't know any of their songs they put out in like the last, it wasn't Gin Blossoms. Who was it? It was somebody like that. It starts with a G. Why can't I think of who it is? And not Guns N' Roses. I would have known a song to put on there. Um, but it was somebody like Jim Blossoms that had like two hits, you know? And she was like, I really like their stuff. What? I was like, Tanya, you don't even know their stuff. She's so funny. And you think about the whole of somebody's life, you know, and you look at that, and I think about my mom, and the things I remember about my mom, and like, you know, the, the things she did, and the things she participated in, and what she enjoyed, and what she had fun doing, but then, like, that's a whole piece of my mother's life that, like, I don't really consider on a regular basis when I'm thinking about her life, which I don't think that much, you know, I mean, I think about my mom, but I don't think much about, like, I don't dissect her life unless I'm sitting on a vlog talking about it, I mean, I don't sit and do this, you know what I mean? If I wanted to, that would be completely fine, but I don't. Um, so, you know, but what's interesting is, like, I don't think about that. Like, you know, how scary. I think just being a single woman, a single mom, most of her life. She was a fearful person anyway, whether she had been single or not, you know. Like, my sponsor is single, and she is not fearful at all. I mean, she is fearless about things. And, um... I mean, she calls me and tells me stories, and she's like, yeah, I had to go to this place, and she's like, you know, I brought so-and-so with me, and we went and pulled this drunk out of, and I'm like, what were you doing over there? And she's like, I just go where I'm needed, and I'm like, oh my God, I feel fearless, you know? She's like, we got her into treatment, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's fearless, you know? And I think it's really a perspective at how you look at life, and, you know, my dad is somebody that's fearless, absolutely fearless, and, um, and I think just exudes confidence, too. Not, I wouldn't say arrogance, but my dad is not arrogant whatsoever, confidence, um, and, but just really fearless, and then my mom was completely fearful, you know, of a lot, of, like, everything, and... It's interesting, I lie somewhere in the middle. There are certain things I'm fearless about. There's other things that I'm full of fear, you know? In recovery, um, fear is an acronym that stands for F everything and run, or um, why can't I think of the other one? Somebody out there is shouting it at the camera. I know they are. faith. What is it? Something appearing real. Why can't I think of it? But it's basically saying, you know, that 
it's really our response to something. It's really, there's nothing real in it. You know, it's like, there was a period of my life when I had, it was between uh, my first and my second boyfriend. And um, I would get really bad panic attacks. And it would be when I was driving, you know, on the road, like on the interstate, interstate, or just even like on roads like this, if there was a lot of traffic, I would get very, very nervous. And I had a friend of mine that had a history of panic attacks and he had like worked through them so well. And um, he had done like extensive work on it, you know? And so I can remember this one time I like pulled over um, I was like taking all side streets and I was driving downtown and I got really nervous. I got kind of, I felt like I was kind of lost. I didn't know where I was. And like my heart started like, oh, this is something else that I, when I was younger, I suffered from this. And what I just like, I grew out of it at some point. You know, I don't know. Maybe it had something to do, like we, we haven't really ever talked about it, my neurologist and I, because it stopped before then. So I don't know. But I, ha I used to have a tachycardia when my heart would race. Um, I would get it when I was playing tennis. And it's like your your heart goes into another thing. And I would have to lay on my back. What I had been taught to do uh, by doctors was lay on my back and put my legs up. And what would happen is my heart would go, boom, boom, boom. Boom. A lot of people that do athletics have it. My stepmom had it as well, too, when she was in high school playing tennis. But um, it would, like, beat out of control. And um, so, anyway, and that's kind of, like, what a panic attack feels like. Your heart does start to race if you've never had one before. You know, it's very real. You cannot tell somebody that is having a panic attack that their feelings are not real. You can't breathe. You feel like your heart's going to stop. <clears throat> it's extremely scary. And thankfully, I only had it for a period of my life, you know? And I think it was when I was, I felt very much alone and I didn't have a partner in life. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I was living alone and I just trying to do my best, you know? And I, I think I was scared about a lot, like my mom had been, you know? Interesting how that kind of comes full circle and talking about this. But I remember this one time I was driving downtown. I was driving actually to go see my friend. We were, I was picking him up and we were gonna go somewhere, go out or something. And it was at night, and I was kind of lost, and I didn't know where I was. And my heart started racing. I was literally ready to get out of the car and put my feet up. That's how bad it was. And I remember I pulled over, and I called him on my cell phone, and I was like, I'm having a panic attack. And he was like, okay. And he was so calm with me. And, um, you know, he talked me through it. He was like, what you're feeling is not real. You need to keep telling yourself this is just an illusion in your head. It's not real. It's going to go away. You need to start taking deep breaths. And he was so calm with me. And he talked me through this panic attack, you know. And he gave me some, like, you know, things to say to myself. And one of the things was, like, he equated it to that scene in The Shining when the, the little boy sees the twins. He's, like, closes his eyes. And he's like, this isn't real. This isn't real. You know, this is just an illusion. Like, and there have been a couple times when I start getting really panicky that I talk myself out of it and I'm like, okay, you know, and I think fear is very much like that too. Um, cause I am somebody that I can turn fear, you know, like, like I've been in situations in water before, like, uh, the snorkeling in Grand Cayman, I've told that story on here one time that we went snorkeling off this boat and we were, it was like Stingray City and the Stingrays were coming up and with them flashing or flapping in the water, they, it looked in the water and felt to me like that scene in Jaws when he, when, when he, when Jaws, uh, eats that kid on the raft with, in the flappings going on. I panicked so hard, you guys. I literally swam. I mean, I swam so fast over this reef and everything, and I literally the entire time felt like a shark was chasing me. Um, I was so panicked. And you can't tell somebody in that moment that what they're feeling isn't real. It is very, very much real, you know? Um, but I think also there's ways to talk ourselves through that, you know? But then there are people, like, I mean, I think for me, it was um, episodic, and I think it was a, a symptomatic of that time, you know, if that makes sense. Like, I think it was only a very short period of my, of my life because of what was going on with me at that time. This semi is literally writing my, you know what, um, but I think it was, you know, it, it just was around that period of my life. It wasn't... Uh, you know, something like, I don't believe that I'm, 
you know, have panic attacks and have that kind of severe anxiety. But I know a lot of people that do. It's very, very real. Okay. I know you guys probably think I go so slow on these roads, but I really don't. That was like half a truck. Can you can't. But anyway, um, you know, I have friends of mine that have severe anxiety and horrible panic attacks and, you know, have to be medicated. And then they're also in recovery. So it's hard because it's like, well, that's what, you know, you use drugs like Xanax for, Klonopin and things like that. And they can't take that. So, you know, they have to, uh, you know, or if they do, it has to be highly monitored, I guess. Um, so they take things that aren't habit forming or they learn breathing exercises or meditation or, you know, like yoga seems to be something that has helped a lot of my friends um, with panic attacks. I don't know. That was just a scary part of my life too, you know. Evidence real. What is that? I need to pull in here. This is driving me crazy. Facts, something. Oh God, I wish Tanya was here. Why can't I think of it? I'm literally like the recovery slogan. What is that car just sitting on the side of the road? You guys, I am so serious. Like this car is just sitting on the side of the road over here. That is so spooky strange. Now I don't want to pull into that gas station. I was going to pull in there to... So, like, when you look at the things that we're afraid of, I think it really says more about the underlying true fear, you know? It's like, and where it comes from. I have to tell you one thing that's really strange, especially since I started doing YouTube, is how many people I meet that have the same fear of, that I do of sharks. And somebody the other day on a vlog or something, I can't remember where it was they said it, it must have been on a vlog that I was sharing it, said that they're, they have the same fear of sharks and their parents used to, oh, it's gonna stop, hold on. And their parents, I think it was their mother, used to watch all of the Jaws movies. And like, it, they were really scared by the Jaws movies too. Can you tell them in my head about the slogans? I can whip off slogans and mottos like nobody's business. And for some reason tonight, I cannot remember what this is. Those slogans in recovery kept me sober my first year. I mean, they really, really did. I just would live by all of them, you know? Like, I would think to myself, you know, keep it simple, stupid, one day at a time. If you always do, which this one really right here was so powerful to me. And it was, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. And like the, the power behind that statement is so strong, you know? Full evidence appearing real. What is it? Like, why can't I get it? I'm like, I don't know why this is... The false evidence appearing real. That's what fear is. False evidence appearing real. Um, you know, and it's... I think that's what it is. I'm almost positive. But it's when we look at something and we think that it's real. But like, you know, it's not. False evidence appearing real. Faith without works is dead. I believe that one. There's this recovery joke, and it's this guy is like drowning out in the middle of the ocean, right? And he's like, God help me, God help me. This is where it's the difference between like God, you know, and religion and spirituality, but this is a religious kind of joke, but I think it's kind of funny. It doesn't have to be a recovery joke. It can be any kind of joke, you know? But it's really the lesson behind the joke. So this guy is drowning out in the middle of the ocean, right? 
and he's like, God help me, God help me. And this boat comes by with these two people on it. They're like, get in, get in. And he's like, no, I'm praying to God, I pray to God. And then he's like, God help me, God help me. And he's, you know, drowning and this helicopter goes by and puts down this um, ladder and it's like, climb up, climb up, we'll save you. And uh, he's like, no, no, I pray to God, I pray to God, God's gonna save me. And so he drowns. <laughs> And he ends up in heaven, and he's in heaven, and um, he meets God, and he says to God, he goes, God, I had faith in you. I prayed to you to save me. And God looks at him and says, I sent a boat, and I sent a helicopter. What more did you want? <laughs> you know, I mean, I think, like, it's so true of life, right? You know, whatever your faith is in, the universe or the wind or cycles of the life or some religious God, you know, or God or higher power or Buddha or whatever, you know, it's like your faith will only get you so far, but you have to put action behind that. And I think that's with anything in life, whatever you believe in, and it doesn't have to be on a spiritual level, you know. I mean, I can believe in a diet all I want, but if I'm not doing the work as proven, nothing's going to happen, you know. And I think that's how we get out of fear, you know. talk about, you know, being full of fear. I think it's hard in those moments, though, that you're full of fear, you know, to really have... If you're a person of, like, any kind of spiritual faith, to have really strong faith. And I think that's really where faith is tested. In believing that what's coming is good. And there is, you know, it's like when Maya Angelou says, we know when you're in the middle of the biggest tragedy in your life, look up and say thank you because you're about to learn the greatest lesson that you've ever learned. Okay, now, the next time that you're in the biggest tragedy, <laughs> tell me how that works. Because it's hard. Like, that's a hard lesson, you know? To be in the middle of that and look up and go, okay, God, you know? It's hard. I think faith is hard. And I think fear and all of it is hard. And I think that's why we continue to learn and grow as, you know, we age and go on this journey of life. All right, I'm going to listen to a little bit of my audio book now. I'm going to get off here. I said it was going to be super short, and it was a little bit longer than super short. So I don't know how long it was. But anyway, I hope you guys are having an amazing Tuesday, unless you have other plans. And like I always say, don't have other plans, but don't, but don't have other plans. Have an amazing day. Have an amazing Tuesday, unless you have other plans, but don't have other plans. Make the most of your day. You're exchanging a day of your life with it. Do something fun. Do something risky. Try Joella's hot chicken if you have it in your area. It is so good. Trust me. And if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. Make sure to look at yourself in the mirror every single day and say to yourself, I love you and that you are valuable and tell yourself positive affirmations about yourself. And most importantly, make sure to pass it on to somebody else and let them know how important they are to you. Um, and that they matter to you. We can pass it on to each other, you know, and help each other out. And I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Love you.